Morning. Welcome to Jerusalem. I don't know if you can tell, but this is amazing. <laughs> you know, when I, was, I, when I was here last week, this was not like this. And so the fact that this all happened in a week, and, and I know, I, I, you know, I just, man, the amount of work um, is awesome. And so if you are not excited... Get excited for VBS. That's your issue, not so, ours. <laughs> we, it is going to be an amazing week. Students are going to have a ton of fun. Uh, we, are, we are so excited for what is to come. Um, I have a couple of announcements uh, for this morning. Um, as always, if you're a first-time guest with us, you can grab a Connect card in the chair back in front of you, um, and that way you can fill that out, get us some information. You can give it to me, you can give it to Josh, you can put it in an offering tray, you can drop it in the box, you can give it to a random person and tell them to give it to one of us. Lots of options. Um, but that way we can uh, just get some information so we can get in contact with you, get you any information that you might need about the church. Um, these, car these cards are also super handy. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, if you have something that you would like us to pray for um, or um, pr pass on to the prayer chain, um, they can be used for that as well. So uh, we like multi-use handy things like that. That's good stuff. Um, VBS announcements. So again, VBS starts tomorrow. Um, we are so excited. And I was given specific things from Angela to say, and I want to pull this up. That way I don't get it wrong because then I will be blamed and I don't want to be blamed. Um, people who are, need shirts can pick up their VBS t-shirts. After church today, there is a table over here in the fellowship hall um, where you can grab that. Um, there is also, or no, yes, yes, there's a table in the fellowship hall. Also, you can check out the mission for VBS, which is in a table, uh, in the lobby back here. Sorry, there's two tables. I was getting confused. There's a table back here with the mission. If you want to learn about what, uh, the mission for VBS for this week of what kids will be raising, um, money for, you can check that out back here in the lobby. If you need a t-shirt for VBS, uh, that can be picked up in the fellowship hall over here. There's a table, you can't miss it. It's right there as you walk through. Um, the last thing with that is there is a quick meeting after church today for VBS leaders. If you are volunteering uh, for VBS, uh, uh, Angela would ask if you would join us um, for a quick meeting after service today uh, to get some uh, final details ironed out and to give you some expectations for the week um, and what to look forward to and get excited about for tomorrow. So uh, join us for that. We are looking forward to that. Um, if you need those repeated again, uh, find me after church. We can point you in the right direction. Also not too late to register. Yes, it is also not too late to register. Uh, we have 107 students so far registered for VBS, uh, which is awesome. We are so excited. Um, I can't say excited enough. Um, but with that, uh, I have one more announcement. Um, coming up at the end of this week, so Saturday, um, and then the following Saturday, I think we have a slide, we have church cleanup. Yes, yeah, Saturday 11th, Saturday the 18th, church cleanup day uh, here at the church, um, 9 to noon. If you would like to help get some projects done, it'll be nice after VBS gets done to get a couple things um, organized and straightened up around the church um, and some different projects around the outside of the building and stuff taken care of. Uh, we are looking forward to getting all of that done and taken care of and sprucing up um, our space and making sure that we are good stewards of what God has given us. Um, if you have any questions about the cleanup days, I'm going to point you to Roxanne. Um, she, yes, she's like, ah, oh, yep. So, um, so if you have any questions, you can talk to her. Um, but with that, let me pray, and then I will pass it off to Matt and our team today who are, um, I, you know, I love acoustic sets, so I'm excited. Well, then you are in for a treat, my friend. Let's do this. Let's do it. Let me pray. Uh, dear God, we thank you so much for today. Uh, we thank you for the excitement of VBS, uh, that it is almost here, that uh, the work, the preparation um, is all going to um, come to fruition tomorrow and uh, this week. Uh, we pray for every student who has registered 
um, and those who we know, uh, who you know, will register that uh, you will be with them and that this can be a week that they grow in their relationship with you, uh, that this can be a moment that stands out uh, in their life and in their faith and in, uh, in their walk with you, God. Um, and we pray strength for the volunteers. Um, VBS can be a long week, but it is an amazing week. And so give the leaders strength that they can persevere um, and that they can continue to love on these kids uh, and we can show them the love of your son. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks a ton, Jed. Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. Who's excited to sing some songs? Yeah? All right. Let's stand up and have at it. sing my great redeemer's praise the glories of my god and king the triumphs of his grace my gracious master and my god assist me to proclaim to spread the earth in your birth abroad the honors of thy name jesus in name Charms our fears and bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets us prisoner free. His blood can make the phallus clean, his blood avail for me. To God all glory. Praise and love be ever now forgiven by saints below and saints above the churchy earth in heaven. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. It's always good to do a little throwback every once in a while, huh? That's good. We're going to do one that we did last week that we started. It's called I Will Look Up. And it's just, what an awesome opportunity to sing a song like this in anticipation of an amazing event like VBS coming up. Amen? Amen. Let's do this. The worries of this world I will lay them at your feet Surrender every anxious thought For perfect peace Your perfect peace And all the loved ones I hold dear all my hopes and dreams and all my fears I will choose to trust your name in everything in everything I will look up for there is none above you I will bow down to tell you that I need Lord of all, Jesus, Lord of all, and I will take you at your word, Jesus, you have taken hold of me, and all my life is in your hands. You are my strength, 
you are my strength. I will look up, for there is none above you. I will bow down to tell you that I need you, Jesus, Lord of all. I will look back and see that you are faithful. morning. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you as family members through your spirit, Lord. We thank you for this time of VBS that not just once a year, Lord, but this moment in time that we get to see children get to know you, sometimes even for the very first time. Lord, we praise you for this opportunity that you have let us be stewards of this week, Lord. Help us not to waste it. Help us to be efficient, Lord with the work that you've called us to do. Lord, I thank you so much for the volunteers and all the work and all the effort that has gone into this week. But Lord, it means nothing unless if your presence is here supervising it. Lord, we ask that your spirit would be in this place and be on these volunteers, Lord, as we engage in spiritual battle this week. Lord, our children are at stake. Lord, give us the courage to fight that spiritual battle this week. We know that there will be complications. We know that Satan and his demons are here, and they want to destroy this church. 
They want to destroy our family, our relationships. Lord, we call out to you this morning to fight. To fight for us when we are weak. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. Help us to continue to worship you with our hearts this morning, Lord, as we continue to listen to Josh's message this morning. In your son's name, amen. You may be seated. It was uh, a few years ago, and many of you know this, so I'm not telling you anything maybe you don't already know, but I had an ATV roll over the top of me, and that uh, was quite an ordeal. But uh, <clears throat> while I was in the hospital, I lost 45 pounds. And many of you are thinking, man, Dave, you need to lose 45 pounds again. <laughs> but... Uh, um <clears throat> I had a feeding tube, and f for whatever the reason, uh, you don't put weight on through a feeding tube, so I don't know exactly. It must just maintain you to keep you going until you can start eating. But um, <clears throat> through all that, the doctors started telling me almost daily, the best thing for healing is nutrition. And when I heard that, that was a green light that let's get down and let's get to eating. And it didn't take long for me to uh, gain that 45 pounds back because I just was eating anything and everything that uh, they would let me eat. Um, and and I, now during this time, I want you to think about your nutrition, your spiritual nutrition, um, the best thing um, for your spiritual health is nutrition. And Josh has said many times during his communion meditations that this is a meal that we're about to share. And this meal will give us the nutrition that we need to have that healthy spiritual life. And as we partake, think of it as a meal. Think of it as a time when you are taking in nutrition to build your spiritual health. And it's this time, but it is also time that we spend in God's word, that we see this also as a, a way to keep us spiritually strong, spiritually healthy uh, nutrition that we need to take in daily. So be thinking about that as remem we remember Jesus and what he has done for us through this communion time, his death, uh, his burial and resurrection, and how we are partaking in eating his body and drinking his blood and using that as nutrition, uh, spiritual um, health and and how that will maintain us and grow us let's pray father in heaven we just thank you so much for your son and what he has done for us uh, so many um, things in our life that take place can remind us of uh, how you can work in different situations to help us better understand you and your love for us, whether it might be through uh, accidents, uh, dealing with health, dealing with loved ones, dealing with losses, uh, whatever it might be, um, we go through those to help us better understand you, help us to uh, rely upon you uh, more and more. And during this time of uh, communion, I just pray that um, uh, our thoughts uh, might be solely um, centered on you and what you have done for us. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Angela. I'm the children's minister here. I'm just taking a minute to come visit you. Um, my class is actually watching right now. So hi, guys. Listen to Mr. Andrew. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know if you guys noticed, but we redecorated a little. It's that, what is it? You know, there's cottage core and there's ancient market core. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> you probably figured out tomorrow uh, VBS kicks off which I seriously I'm so excited this is our Super Bowl this pro this process started in January we started meeting in March to um to start planning things and uh last week Elizabeth Chuka and Andrew Bundy and I just kind of camped here guys I drink so much Diet Coke it's not even funny it's not, I'm gonna need to be tested or something but I am very, very excited because I really, really love VBS. Um, and uh, just a quick story to kind of let you know why. Um, so a few years ago, another place I was working, we were kicking off our fall programming and this grandma came in with her third grade granddaughter. And this girl was terrified. She did not want to be there. She was overwhelmed. She's hiding behind grandma. And so I'm, I'm sitting there talking to grandma and all of a sudden this girl looks at me and she goes, you are on stage with blue hair. Um, she had come to VBS and saw me in a blue wig running around like an idiot. So I was like, yeah, that was me. And she immediately started loosening up. And then she saw her VBS leader. And then she was golden. She, she came almost every Sunday after that. I love how VBS lets us make connections and get to know the kids we already have here, but also kids that maybe don't have a church or maybe, you know, have not been to church in a while. We have over 100 kids signed up. A lot of them are not regular attenders here. So I am so excited to not only introduce them to our church community, but also to remind them how much they are loved right now by the creator of the entire universe. I love reminding kids of that. So I wanna say thank you to you, because if you notice, this takes a few resources. <laughs> And the reason we get to do this and do it really well is because of your generosity. So thank you for helping us put this on, but also thank you for making children's ministry a priority because a lot of places it's not. So thank you once again. Um, if you are a leader for VBS, can you raise your hand? Raise your hand. We're excited. <laughs> Say a prayer for us and uh, thanks again. Bye. Morning. morning. How y'all doing? You can tell we're pretty excited around here. Uh, we are excited for it, it, just to kind of put it in perspective. Over a hundred kids. Think of how many families we're connecting with this this coming week. Think of how many uh, of their friends we're potentially connecting with as they go to school in the fall. A hundred kids in this space that we get to worship with and minister with, many of which aren't connected to our church. This is an amazing example of God's movement and potential of the mission of God going out and sharing his love with a wider and wider audience. I am beyond excited for this week. I've had a, a few questions here. I just want to give an explanation. You notice uh, I, have a, I have a purple sparkly finger. <laughs> Um, I've had a few people question me. No, I'm not trying to start a fashion trend or anything. Uh, but we've had, we've had volunteers in and out of the, the church all week, um, which for me, the extrovert is awesome. I personally work better when there's stuff happening. Um, and yesterday, I'm sitting at my desk, and I'm doing some final details for the sermon today, and in walks little Becca Chuka, uh, who's a, a four-year-old daughter of Elizabeth Chuka, one of our volunteers kind of helping set all this up. So Saturday morning, I'm in here working, and Becca Chuka walks in, and she, got, she goes, can I paint your nails? <laughs> when a four-year-old girl asks, you to, asks if you want a manicure, I don't care how busy you are, you say yes. So... <laughs> 
She's painting one hand while I'm typing my sermon. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing other details here on the sermon with my other hand. Um, and I was cleaning it up later, just, you know, clean it off and just didn't have the heart to erase that last one. So thanks, Becca. I think she's back in the, in the back right now. But thanks for uh, the manicure. I'm, I'm showing it on camera now. So you did a good job. <laughs> well, hey, folks, um, we have been in this series that uh, we're calling um, Joyful. And really, we're, we're taking this time to look, <coughs> excuse me, look at the connections between contentment, generosity, and joy, and how they all fall in to this mission of Jesus that we've each been given. We've been rotating, kind of orbiting around this, this focus verse in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 7. And it says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And that, that, that phrase, cheerful giver, is really the center of what we've been talking about. The difference between a cheerful giver and a guilty giver, or a, a compulsive giver, or a giver who gives because it's a, a check mark on a checklist, because they have to, because it's their duty. No, what God is saying here is, God loves a cheerful giver, someone who gives out of joy. So that was the kind of uh, uh, reason we started kind of sitting in on this idea. What does it look like to be truly joyful, to be a cheerful giver? What are the steps it takes to get there? Our first week, we were talking about contentment and talking about how we are blessed to bless others, that, that we are ourselves taken care of completely by the grace of God, and because we are taken care of, we have the ability to be content. And it's from that contentment, it's from that understanding that we are good, that God's got us, that allows us to be generous. And in fact, it's those blessings that we receive that are the equipping power for us to be able to bless others. Last week, we started looking at examples of a generous posture throughout Scripture, starting way off in the beginning with, uh, with Cain and Abel and their offering in worship, and going all the way into uh, the New Testament, we started to look at uh, incredible acts of sacrifice, sacrificing everything people owned for the sake of the mission of Jesus, the poor and the hungry. And in it, we were looking at this idea of a posture of generosity, meaning so much more than dropping money in a plate or writing a check to an organization, but rather having this, this posture of generosity, a generous spirit being changed by the grace of God so that you can give your time, your effort, your, your money, your resources, your presence. Today, I want to kind of rest on that generous posture just a little bit more and start looking at the effects of generosity, the why we do this. And so for our main scripture, we're actually going to expand on our focus verse. We've been looking at 2 Corinthians 9-7. Today we're going to look at a big chunk right around that in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And so I want to give you a little bit of a, a background of this book, this letter from Paul, and why it's so important about talking about generosity. Um, so this, 2 Corinthians, is actually Paul's fourth letter to the church in Corinth, which is in the area that's in modern-day Greece, okay? It's actually his fourth letter, not his second. Uh, we actually don't have copies of the first and the third letter, so 1 Corinthians is actually his second letter, and uh, 2 Corinthians is actually his fourth letter. There's some arguments from scholars that pieces of those two missing letters have kind of worked their way into our current scripture. But when you look at 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you're largely looking at a one-sided conversation, a series of letters to the church in Corinth. And the 2 Corinthians letter is largely the end of the conversation because there's actually trouble in Corinth through this conversation. Through the years, there was this ongoing conflict between this church in Corinth and the surrounding area and Paul the Apostle. Even though Paul is the one who founded the church, he's the one who planted it and got it started, and the one who planted the very seeds of the church, there appears to be some considerable doubt among the believers of that church 
whether or not Paul was a trustworthy source, a trustworthy authority on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so there was this back and forth. You hear Paul addressing um, the, a group of people called the Judaizers that were trying to come in and say, no, you can only be Christian if you're Jewish first, uh, and just making different claims about where his authority comes from. But a big chunk of this conflict was due to this interference of a, another group of wealthy, influential teachers that claimed to speak on behalf of Jesus. And eventually, these, uh, these leaders start teaching against Paul's message of grace and humility because of the power of Jesus. And they're the ones who cast doubt because Paul is this poor tent maker. He's obviously not very wealthy. He's homeless half the time. But look at us. We're the, we're the teachers with success, so you should listen to us. And those teachers end up charging, which is why Paul, at least we think they did, which is why Paul is addressing uh, um, how funds are given and why funds are given in a lot of ways. So eventually the leaders in the church in Corinth, um, they, they see the errors of their ways, they see the problem in listening to these, and eventually they want to reconcile with Paul, and they reach out to Paul, and they're like, hey, my bad, um, we want to we wanna be good again. We want to we wanna get in the good graces of you here. We, we made a mistake. And so 2 Corinthians, the whole letter, which is actually, again, the fourth letter that Paul wrote, is actually Paul's response to that reconciliation. It's actually him writing a letter reconciling himself to the people in Corinth, saying, yeah, we need to be brothers. We need to be unified and, and addressing some of the concerns this has kind of laid around, but, but really it's him trying to kind of heal that divide. But there was still a problem in Corinth. Okay, there was still a problem there. See, currently there was a famine in Jerusalem. There was a famine going on, a small famine, not a huge uh, uh, piece of history, but it was enough where specifically the Jewish Christians were suffering from starvation and poverty. And so Paul, being the uh, apostle that has been given charge over ministering to the Christians outside of Jerusalem, to the, uh, the Christians that come from non-Jewish families, had this great idea to go around to all of the Christian churches in um, the areas that aren't Jewish to raise money to send back to Jerusalem to be able to feed their starving brothers. Most of the churches jumped on this. They're like, yes, this is the perfect chance to finally show that we are one people. It doesn't matter whether you were born in a Jewish family or a Greek family. We are all one people under the grace of God. And so the churches in Macedonia, uh, the churches in, in Ephesus, they all gathered funds and they're sending money back to Jerusalem to deal with the famine and starvation in Jerusalem among the Christians there. However, in Corinth, due to this ongoing period of conflict with Paul and the direction of those false teachers, they didn't save any money for this. They had actually initially refused to help. And as a result, the coffers were empty. And so Paul saw this as proof that there was more work to be done with this church. Because while, while they, they leaned in and while they were like, yes, we want to reconcile, we believe in humility, we believe in grace, we believe in Jesus, Paul's like, awesome. What about generosity? And they're like, ah, oh, that one's hard. And he's like, I know it's hard, but let's talk about it. And so right in the middle of Paul's uh, uh, fourth letter, 2 Corinthians, in chapters 8 and 9, there's this block of text that seems out of the ordinary. He's talking about, yay, we're together, awesome, here's where my authority comes from, we can be one people, and then chapters eight and nine, it's like, generosity, you should give money. And it's like, whoa, dude, <laughs> tone change. But what he's doing is he's trying to address this need. He's seeing, he's like, all right, this people are ready, this church is ready, they're, they're ready to jump on board, they wanna be part of the brethren, but he saw this this little piece, this lack of generosity, 
as something that needed to be corrected. Because to Paul, to have your heart changed by the presence of Jesus means having a generous posture. That's a reflection of that. So he's like, hey, let's pause and let's talk a little bit about what the generosity of a Jesus follower actually looks like. And that's where we get chapters 8 and 9. So, all of that to say, we're going to expand on chapter 9 in 2 Corinthians, and we're going to read that section here and kind of work through it a little bit. Okay? So, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6. Paul's voice talking to Corinthians. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will reap generously. And then we get to our focus verse. Each of you should give what you have decided to give in your own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. So in this section right here, Paul is reiterating that we are not meant to give out of guilt or compulsion, but instead out of joy. Okay, we've talked about that a lot. The idea that we need to have the joy of a changed heart, the joy of someone who understands the gift of forgiveness that we've received, that, that contentment that we have in Jesus allows us to give. But he also illustrates in this section that we have been given these abundant blessings for the purpose of doing good works, for the purpose of investing it into the kingdom. Because right there you see, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. And then he kind of pulls away from that. And he'll revisit it in a second, but here we're going into verse uh, 10. Now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will also increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Verse 11. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now when you read that, a prosperity preacher, we talked a little bit about the dangers of prosperity gospel in the beginning of the series, but a prosperity preacher would see that and go like, hey, see, if you're generous, God will make you rich. It says it right there. It's actually not what it says. It's all in the purpose of our reward. Because the purpose of our reward is to increase our blessing towards others so that you can be generous on every occasion. So it's not about you. It's not about your reward. It's about the mission of God. Yes, as you bless others, God will continue to bless you, but it's equipping you for a purpose. Think of it as gas in the tank, not a new car, okay? Gas in the tank to keep you on the road, not allowance for luxury as a reward for devotion. That's not what it is. But rather, the farther you need to drive, the more gas you need. That means that if God parks a tanker in your front yard, pack your bags, you've got work to do, all right? The blessing is given to you so that you can bless others. And as you bless others, God will continue to put fuel in the tank so that you can bless others even more. Verse 12. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace that God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. 
And this is where he turns it. Your generosity is not simply providing resources for others. It's doing that on one level, and that's awesome. But your generosity, powered by the grace and joy of Jesus Christ, goes beyond that. And it communicates that same joy and that same grace and that reliance and submission to God to others. Our lives become an example of the values of God. Valuing humility and service for the sake of others over power and security. And make no mistake, this is a shocking example. Because in our culture, we are used, so used to, uh, to power and security being the goal. So much so that it's even made its way into the church. I'm guilty of it, where I'll preach, like, hey, if you just do this, you'll be powerful. Because we're so used to thinking that way. We're not the one who's supposed to be powerful. It's God. So to live with that reversal, with that humility, is such a shocking example that people notice. They perk up. Lives change because of example, because of action, because of relationship. Not sermons from an overweight slob on stage. Sorry. If you are a Jesus follower, you have a role to play in the mission. I can talk till I'm blue in the face. I can, up, I can be up here and I can deliver sermon after sermon and break down every verse of the Bible for you. But I am mainly talking to you, people who either already follow Jesus or are already seeking to know more about Jesus or at least, at the very least, are being dragged by grandma to come hear some weird fat guy talk. <sighs> I'm talking to the choir. You're the ones, though, who see, who truly see the needs of your community, the people around you. You're the ones have the, that have the greatest impact, potential for impact in our community. You guys right now have far more influence and potential impact over the kingdom of God than I ever will. If the church... The Jesus community, if the church is going to rise to the occasion and reflect the light of Jesus into the dark corners of the world, I'm telling you the truth, it's not going to happen because I preach better or because our music is louder or because our stages are cool, although this is really cool. <laughs> it's going to be because the generosity of God's people is so jarring, is so beautiful, that it draws people in. Generous in the way we reach out to others and invite them in. Generous in the way we make room for the newcomers. Generous in the way that we serve our neighbors, our communities, and our congregation. Generous with our own homes to provide space, to make room for neighbors at our table. Generous with our grace, our forgiveness, our love, embracing every person as a native-born sibling. We talked about that in the first week. Embracing every person as a native-born sibling in Jesus, regardless of past or current mistakes. And generous with our money, supporting the mission of God and providing for those that need it. In other words, when it comes to the potential of true revival in the church, true revival in our culture, you have far more influence than I do. You do. That's just the way that it works. And that's the way that it was designed to work because the church is a movement. It's not a place. It's not a static organization. It's not a building on a hill somewhere or a steeple in a field. The church is a movement. It's people coming together, embracing the mission of Jesus and giving all that they have to the mission of Jesus and going out and multiplying themselves a hundred, ten, ten thousand fold. I almost said ten hundred. What the heck? I guess math was never my strong suit. 
But that's the church. The church is a movement. You can take the building and the church can still be powerful. You can take the stage. You can take the music. You can take the mics. And we're still a movement. All of this is here to help us equip each other to be able to be the movement. And that movement is based in generosity. Because a heart that is changed by Jesus is a generous heart. Generous with our time, generous with our presence, generous with our availability, generous with our grace, our forgiveness, generous with our person, and yes, generous with our money. But it's not about just money. It's about so much more than money. See, we have to look for the right results when we're talking about generosity. Because there is a, a danger, and I see it all the time in churches, there is a danger of what I would call entitlement as a result of our generosity. Because we're like, hey, I've sacrificed, I've done my work, I'm waiting for my blessing. Psalm uh, uh, 4 says this, and by the way, I'm going to be reading out of the uh, uh, English Standard Version, the ESV. I've said this before, I'll say it again. Uh, I read a whole bunch of different versions of the Bible. I don't believe that there's one translation of the Bible that is better than others. In fact, I would encourage you to read as many different translations as possible. If you're ever reading uh, in your scripture and you get to a place that's kind of hard to understand, switch translations, read it in a different translation. Uh, because different translations may offer different insights. King James Version, NIV, uh, NLT, ESV, some of you guys are just hearing me say letters. I understand that. Some of you guys understand what I'm saying. Totally good. Uh, but this version is the English Standard Version, so it's not the same version as the Bibles in your seats, but uh, it'll be on the screen. Psalm 4, verse 6. There are many who say, Who will show us some good? When do I get mine? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and their wine abound. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord. Make me dwell in safety. In other words, this kind of sets up this, this kind of situation where someone's saying, I've been so good, I've sacrificed so much, I've given so much. When's it going to come my way? When do I get mine? Why is life still hard? I thought if I, if I gave to the church, I thought if I served, then like life would get easier. Come on, God. I need my reward. I'm still driving my beat-up tempo. But the psalmist here is asking, where is your joy? Where is your joy? Because right there in verse 7, he's talking to God, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and their wine abound. I have more joy than they have when they're wealthy. So where is your joy? Is your joy in personal reward or the movement of God? Money is just one way of blessing others. God will equip us with the blessings we need for the mission of head. But, but some of those blessings might not be money. Some of those blessings will be time, family. Family is a huge blessing. Peace or a million other things that can equip you other than money. Money is one tiny little thing in blessing. Granted, it has a big role to play in our culture, but it's not the end-all, be-all of success. It's just one form of blessing. That's why we can have joy in the face of hardship. Because God has given us so much through his, through his son Jesus, so much uh, abundance in the form of grace that we can stand on one area of hardship, poverty, health, whatever, and still have joy because we know that God has provided so much for us. We are taken care of. We play by different rules than the rest of the world. As Jesus followers, we play by different rules. Hebrews 13 and verse 14 says this, For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. 
For here we don't have the enduring city, but we are looking for the city of the future, the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Our focus is not on some trophy or enduring city, as it puts, that we have here. If you're looking for success that makes sense in the worldly understanding, it's not here. Our focus is something else. It's the city to come. It's the fruition of God's plan. It's eternity. It's love. It's redeeming the world back to the way that God made us. We have a standard of heaven, not the standard of the world. Okay? It's it's different games with very different results. All right? If you are are going in to work on the gospel and and you're you're looking for wealth, that's a bit like trying for a touchdown in bowling. If you're trying for a touchdown in bowling, chances are good that you're not playing football or bowling very well. We play by different rules. We play by a different game. We have an upside-down kingdom. Our successes are beyond the scope of what this world defines as success. It's not wealth. It's eternity. Any blessing we have... And make no mistake, you have an abundance of blessing. Every single person here has an abundance of blessing. The fact that you draw breath is an abundance of blessing. You have an abundance of blessing given to you for the purpose of expanding the kingdom of God, to show people who they really are, to love the world, to redeem them, to pull them out of darkness, to shine a light into the dark corners. You have been blessed. Whatever that blessing is, it's given to you so that you can invest it in this kingdom. If you were looking for a specific type of blessing in response, you're missing the point. Don't play bowling looking for a touchdown. We see this in Scripture. You hear me read this section of Scripture all the time, and you're going to hear it years to come because it is one of the most important sections of Scripture, and that's Acts 2. Acts 2 describes the very beginning of the church. It gives us the the, uh, image of what the church is created to be and what they were like right in the beginning. And it becomes an example for us Jesus followers later in history as we look back to what the church looked like in its simplest form and how we can become more like them who were just right there at the time of Jesus' ascension. Which makes sense. Today is actually Pentecost. That's today. Today. The day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is essentially the church's birthday. It's the day that we celebrate the birth of the church. And the, the event that we, that we kind of center on the birth of the church is described right there in Acts 2. And it's when the Holy Spirit comes down and it, it, it just empowers the believers of Jesus. And there's this really cool supernatural scene and it's awesome and, and that shows the power of God. And then as a reaction to that, the people of God come together. And we see the very first description of the Jesus community. It's right there in Acts 2, 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And then we see the results. The results of having such a powerful community built on the grace and generosity of God. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This day, the birthday of the church, the day that we celebrate 
what the church is, is the perfect day to talk about what it means to have a generous heart and the results of a community built around that concept. Because when you have a group of people that are so focused on the life changing, world shaking grace of Jesus, so content with the fact that no matter what our flaws are, our mistakes and our scars, we are ourselves saved and redeemed. So understood and captivated the idea, by the idea that we are forgiven and, and taken care of and healed, that we can just share everything we have, that we can bless the world, that we can look, go out of our way to look for ways where we can have our lives intersect with others and finding ways to speak in to other people's lives, finding ways to speak in to their places of need, to be able to lift people up out of their brokenness, to be able to recognize the same brokenness that I feel in others and be able to say, hey, brother, I've been there and I'm going to pull you up. And everything I have, everything I am, has been given to me so that I can do that. The result is an explosion of the movement. Generosity is not just about keeping the lights on in the church. That is one thing, and it's important, and I don't want to diminish that. Giving to the church is important. But way more than that is having a heart of generosity, having a posture of generosity, because that is indicative of a changed life. And, and I want to speak honestly from my heart. If you're having trouble embracing that generosity, look to Jesus. How generous was he with you? Do you have contentment about what God has given you? Or are you protective of your blessings? Do you have open doors and open seats at your table? Or is that your sanctuary closed off from the world so you can protect it and preserve it? Because I tell you the truth, everything, every breath we take is a gift from our most holy God designed for the redemption of the world. That's our goal. The redemption of the world. It just comes down to the question, are you in? Are you in? And I'm not saying that that means that, all right, I'm going to sell my house and give everything to the church. No, no, no. Are you in? Are you willing to have a posture of generosity to be able to give everything you have everything you are towards building up those that are broken, giving a window into the same love and forgiveness that you've seen. Are you in? Let's pray. Dear Father God, <coughs> I confess, you know, I like my stuff. I don't always see your blessings when they arrive. I don't always see them as blessings. I get focused on specific blessings because that's what I value. And <clears throat> you have given me so much more than that. God, I rest on your grace. I rest on your forgiveness. I rest on the identity that you have given me as a child of God. And anything I have whether it be the money in my wallet, whether it be the space in my, at my table, or whether it be the breath in my lungs. God, if there's a way for me to invest that into the kingdom in such a way that other people can feel just a taste of the forgiveness and the grace and the redemption and the healing that I have felt, God, I want to be all in. And for everybody that can hear my voice, I, I pray the same prayer. God, show us your blessing. Show us the blessing we already have, the abundance that we already enjoy. Unsettle us with the fact that we have more than others in a lot of areas. And show us ways where we can invest the very breath in our lungs. 
so that others can understand the same forgiveness that we have. We want to be joyful believers of, of the Jesus community. We want to be the cheerful givers. We want to see revival. We want to see our culture change and explode. We want to see you in huge ways. We want to see lives change, hearts mend. We want to see relationships heal. We want to see the hungry eat. We want to see the homeless in homes. We want to see people change. We want to see love rather than the hate and divisiveness that we see all over this world right now. We want to rest on that love. And so if we can be the example, if we have anything in us that can empower us to be the example of what that joyful love, what that joyful grace looks like in this world, God, let us have the strength to do that. Let us be beacons of your generous spirit in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close out our service this morning, we're going to teach you guys a new song that we haven't done in this church. Uh, it's called King of My Hearts, by, um, arranged by John and Sarah McMillan, and we would invite you to uh, sing with us this morning. If you're familiar with it, uh, we'd love to have you just uh, sing a little louder, uh, and those who are not familiar with the song. Um, but ultimately, um, it, the verses go, Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. And then it keeps going on to say, let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. This is one that we introduced at one of our vision nights here previously, and just to see and to witness the power of this song go through the people that were present there. It was really awesome to behold. So I invite you to stand up and sing with us this morning. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, and you are good. You are good, you're good, oh, and you are good, you're good, no, oh, and you are good, good, no, let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart and be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. And you are good, you're good, no. Never do.
gonna let you're never gonna let me down you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down and you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down and you're never gonna let you're never gonna let down he is good let him be the god let him be the 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 fountain let him be the source of our strength not any of this stuff that the world offers but rather let us have our soul focus on jesus christ as we go forward from here well just a heads up remember there is a uh, vbs meeting after service today so if you're a part of the vbs team stick around um, but everybody else god everybody else guys uh, god empower you guys to walk out of here may you be reflections of god's grace to have that generous heart and that generous posture with the world outside. All right, pray with me and we'll go. Dear God, give us the strength to go forward as lights and beacons of your grace. Give us the ability to be able to stand as reflections of your power and your generous power. God, you are awesome. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week.